Good morning, and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am Krista Burns at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event where we cover various Commission activities or any sort of um, activities that may be of interest to librarians across the state in Nebraska. Um, we do these sessions every Wednesday at 10 a.m. Central Time. They are free, one-hour sessions, about whatever it takes. <laughs> um, and they are recorded so that if you do not are not able to attend one of our live sessions, you can always listen to one of our many, many recordings that we have out there. Um, we have guest speakers that sometimes come in and do presentations, and sometimes we have commission staff as we do today. We have um, um, this morning. Um, and today we have one of our commission staff members, Sally Snyder, who is going to <laughs> talk about the um, this year's summer reading program, um, right. making, a uh, making a splash. Um, and give you some ideas for books for the to use for the kids. So I am going to pass the mouse over. Well, actually, you use a keyboard for the yeah for that, but I'll leave the mouse to, to go to the website. Right. right. There we go. So make make a splash is the children's theme. Make a splash read is the children's theme, and make waves at your library is the teen theme. And I just wanted to let you know that this first um, slide on this um, presentation is a PowerPoint slide that was created by um, Upstart for us to use. And if you want to use the same slide, or there's a couple for the children's theme. This one was from the teen theme. Um, they're on your disk that came with your um, manual. Uh -huh. So you can use it to give a presentation if that's if you're going to be doing a PowerPoint. We had asked them a couple years ago to start giving us some a graphics of that you can slides. use and stuff, yeah. I was going to say the very fancy, nice graphics you did there, Sally. But <laughs> <laughs> I downloaded it and put it in my presentation. It was uh, not too hard. But before we start talking about books, I just want to show you, I'm going to switch us over to the Commission web page just for a minute to show you where you can find a, a list, a PDF of all the titles, almost all of the titles I'm going to talk about today. So if you go to the website and you click on Search, and type in handouts and search. The first thing that comes up is Nebraska Library Commission handouts. See, I'm the only one using this so far because I'm the one that asked for it <laughs> because I gave a presentation in the panhandle and they said, can you put it up? And I thought, this will be a way for people to find things. So if other commission staff people decide to start using this page, we'll probably come here and it'll be, you know, Sally Snyder and Krista Burns and and other names, so then you can click on my name. And right here, Summer Reading Program Handout, you can click on that, and it's a PDF of the titles and <clears throat> order information. And also, my most, most of them have my blurb on it, too. So you can just sign off now and go print. I'm kidding. <laughs> you don't get to see the book covers with this, though. and that's the other thing about that. So that was just to show you, oh, good. Um, where to find the information, and if you have a question about that, ask now or ask me later. I'll be glad to send you the URL to find that. And now let's go ahead and talk about, um, sorry, talk about books. So we'll start with fic fiction picture books, and the first book is about a, a little boy who's helped his mom mix together the ingredients to bake a cake, and while it's baking, he has to go take a bath and he is not very eager. But while he's in the bathtub, a couple of fish jump up out of the water and he dives under the water and looks around and he sees all kinds of fish and shells and things on the bottom of what we would think of as the sea. Mm -hmm. And he finds a treasure map and then he finds a treasure <laughs> chest. And when he opens up the treasure chest, it's soap and shampoo. <laughs> and the eel and the octopus get him all scrubbed up. He's really not too keen again. But he gets out of the bath just in time to have a piece of cake. So it ends happily. Yeah. Um, this is a, a fictional account of a true story of a female manatee who was hit by some motorboats and mm. da dam injured. And they took her to an aquarium. And while she was recovering, she gave birth to a calf. Oh. And after she recovered enough, they returned them both to the wild. But it's, it's a warning about, you know, let's take care of the animals of the world. Mm. Rita and What's It is just fun. The first book about them was called Rita and What's It. This is the second book. And they go to the beach. And they're both really excited, but it turns out they want to do different things. 
So um, they kind of are uh, working against each other until the end of the story where they find an imagination game that they both really love playing. And maybe next time Rita will win. What's it? The dog is pretty good. Then we have Paddington, and this is a beginning counting book when uh, seagulls join Paddington one at a time at the beach, and when there are ten of them all together, they go after his sticky bun. But Paddington has a backup plan. We all know that there are alligators in the sewers of oh. New York City. Yes. <laughs> Um, so this is a story about, you know, they're not just in the sewer. In this very fun story, very silly story, the author talks about where else. You can see them back there having some hot dogs. They do like hot dogs, and they also hang their laundry on the um, cables that hold the bridges up. So if you see laundry flapping in the breeze, it's the alligators. <laughs> very silly, and there's a, a note at the back that says that no worker has ever seen an alligator in the sewer system of New York. Hmm. But I emphasize the word worker. <laughs> <laughs> this is a, a cumulative story. Splish, splash, rumba, rumba, bim, bam, boom. A monster is coming and the boy hides up a tree in the swamp. Pretty soon his younger sister comes along and says, Mom says it's time to come home, it's bedtime. And she hears the noise and up the tree she goes. Well, cousins come and... The dog comes, and pretty soon, the monster is there. But he hears the noise, too, and he goes up the tree. <laughs> Finally, it's Mom. It's time to go home to bed. She's been the noise. <laughs> a hot summer day on the farm soon turns into a booming thunderstorm with hail. Everyone runs for the house, but Dad has to go back out again in the rain again to bring in the daughter's favorite chicken. When the storm is over, there's a surprise outside for everyone, and you find out why the chicken didn't come in by itself. Very appropriate for here in Nebraska. That's true. <laughs> Very much so. Especially this time of year. <laughs> this one isn't so much our area of the world, but it's also fun. Little, little polar bear, Lars, meets a cormorant named Connie, who introduces him to some beluga whales. The whales are soon in danger when a modern whaling ship comes looking for the sperm whale who just arrived. Mm. Lars thinks of a plan to keep them all safe. Uh, this is just a fun, quick little story. Little Tugboat is very independent, and he goes out into the ocean through uh, dangerous whirlpools and storms and other things, so he can meet up with his friends. They are ocean creatures, and they have fun adventures together. Very imaginative, but just a fun little, nice story time book. This one is another one that will work well for story time. A boy travels to and from the beach in his imagination, and he uses, among other things, a helicopter, a tractor, and a camel, who actually makes a pretty good friend. And then he thinks about where he might go tomorrow. He's standing by the window in his home. Um, this is a cautionary tale of global warming. Tigluck and his grandmother prepare and then go in search of the polar bear that visited their village. They don't find her, but they find a young cub, and then they know she's She's dead, and they take the cub back to their village to help it learn how to live in a warmer world. Very fun. This is a uh, mermaids gather near the beach to prepare and hold a party to celebrate the first night of summer. They drape a string of pearls and other items over some branches. They have a meal, and then they swim and dance all night long. And in the morning, there's only one thing left on the beach that lets you know that the mermaids were ever there. And you can challenge the, the I think mostly girls will read this book, but I could be wrong. You can challenge them to see if they can find that one thing left on the beach. Catamaran, bark canoe, kayaks made for one and two. Rhyming text gives a look at a variety of boats conveying some good information along the way. Though some are whimsical, such as the whale boat, which shows a whale in a rowboat, <laughs> um, most of them are nonfiction type information. So you've got a combo here. But again, it would be fun to read at story time. This one would be too, but I don't know. You might you might encourage bad behavior because these are bad frogs. They just are. This is a celebration of bad behavior, and it seems there is no hope for improvement. These frogs do things like chew gum, go too fast on their skateboards. I'm talking bad, I'm bad <laughs> frogs. And... Um, it's just silly fun, and kids will love the idea of frogs just really being, and they stick their tongues out. Look at that guy. They're just bad. 
This is sequel to class two at the zoo, and the teacher takes class three on a tour boat, but they are soon boarded by pirates. Not to worry, the class has made some aquatic friends during their tour, and it's a silly adventure and another good read aloud. This is a retelling of a story from Japanese folklore. An older wealthy man lives up on a mountain and can see the village and the ocean from his land. The village is having a celebration, but Ojisan, which means grandfather, first feels an earthquake and then sees the ocean running away from the beach. He knows that means a tsunami is coming. The village isn't paying attention They're in their celebration, so he does the only thing he can think of to save them, which is to set his rice field on fire. Oh, and the people in the village see that, and they some of them run up, and he won't let them put the fire out. The whole village comes up to put the fire out, and they're all saved from the tsunami. But he is now a pauper because he burned his complete rice field wow. to save all their lives. I love this book. It's a beautiful story. The artwork is gorgeous. I think some of the scenes don't work as well as this one on the cover, but um, it's an interesting art format, and uh, you should give it a try. Rhyming text tells of Gulliver's nightly adventures. Gulliver Snip had a clipper ship that his mother called the bathtub. Each night the shower curtain takes a beating and the floor gets all wet. Listeners will enjoy his adventures. Mothers maybe not so much, but... <laughs> Miranda and her mother spend the day at the beach, building a sand castle, taking a dip, and meeting a crab. It's a look at a typical day with a bit of philosophy about the nature of the world. Old, let's see, old man Gator starts the tale with a tip-tap-tap of his toes, and one by one, swamp creatures join the music with their own sounds. So after you've read the story, you can have the listeners each take an animal sound and then have them all make their noises together and mm -hmm. see what kind of symphony you might have. Or cacophony, we're not sure <laughs> This is a version of the fisherman and his wife. In this version, the man and the wife are Aztec, and eventually the wife wants to become a god. It's well done and a, a lovely artwork. Tacky is back. Tacky is as unusual as ever, and this time it is his, it is his love and hoarding of s'mores that may end up helping to save the day. From eggs hatching to migration in the fall, this gentle story tells of a trumpeter swan family and shows the four cygnets learning to swim, to eat, and eventually to fly. This just mm -hmm. makes me feel so sympathetic because <laughs> this is based on the author's brother. Wow. Only the fact that he would not get in the swimming pool, and as adults we forget that that pool looks pretty big. Mm -hmm. And he oh. had his, he, this boy won't get in the water. Look at him sweating there, and he's looking at the water, and he just can't make himself get in there. And even his younger sister learns to swim before he ever decides to finally get off of the side and get into the pool. But it's, it's a little bit fun and also a little bit silly. No, I'm not moving. Oh, that's good. Okay. I did this. Right. It's okay. 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 Sorry. Go ahead. Ridley, Riley, sorry, Riley goes to Australia to help his aunt, uncle, and cousin investigate the loss of parts of the great coral reef due to bleaching, which is the change in water temperature that causes the algae to leave and the coral to starve. It's a good combination of a fictional story with nonfiction information scattered throughout, and all of the illustrations are like the cover. There's part photograph and part cartoon artwork. That's cool. It's kind of different. Very fun. The baby is caught inside a bubble blown by his sister, and he floats away with the family following after him, trying to bring him back. This would be a good story to read when you're blowing bubbles at your library. <laughs> <laughs> Rhyming text tells about a number of things penguins can do, including you could fly underwater or sing a duet, you could live on land but get really wet, and so on. It's, it's great fun with adorable pictures. Yes. This rhyming story tells of a coconut's trip far away from his owner in Tennessee and off to a faraway island where a monkey takes it up a tree and drops it so all the animals can share in the meat and milk of the coconut. I love this penguin story. <laughs> One penguin of the group, there's a group of about seven or so penguins, she, her name, I think her name is Edna, and she wonders <laughs> if there are any colors in the world besides blue and black and white. 
Um. And she really thinks there must be some other color. So she finally decides to go look for them. And she finds another color. She finds orange. <laughs> because that's the color of the researcher's tent. Uh. And, and so she brings all of her friends back with her so they can all see orange too. And at the end of the story, she's wondering again, is there another color besides this? <laughs> Rhyming text gives us a look at all the fun places to go and things to do in the summer. It's not all about water, but uh, every so often there's a page that has something to do, you know, either a swimming pool or the lake or at the beach. So I think it will work really well for this summer. And besides, there's lots of fun things to do for kids anyway, if, even if we all have to work. <laughs> Brief rhyming text tells of the ponies on Assateague Island and how they are rounded up once a year to swim the channel to Chincoteague. So all of us who've read Misty of Shinkachi yes, know Yes, I had story. that book as a, as a teenager. I loved it. <laughs> and I did too. And, and this one is good because it's for younger kids who don't know that story yet, haven't mm. been able to read that story yet. So um, it's a, a nice read aloud, and it tells the story very well. And there's an author's note at the back that talks about the pony mm. pinning day. A just-hatched sea turtle leaves the nest and goes the wrong way. Oh. One by one, he tries to live like different other turtles, a box turtle, a painted turtle, a diamondback terrapin, but none of those lives are for him. A beetle and a crab help get him back on track and heading out to sea, and it includes a few turtle facts at the back of the book. Jackie Robinson bought a home with a pond in Connecticut, and it was a great place for the kids to run and play with the neighbors and swim in the pond. This is a memory of Sharon Robinson, of her father. She remembers this oh, event. Wow. But it's in the, in the fiction section because we know memories aren't always mm. entirely true. But this is how she remembers it. They often swam in the pond, but he never did. One winter, they asked him to check if the ice was frozen enough for them to skate on it. He couldn't swim, and she didn't know that at the time. She didn't know that till later. But he walked carefully onto the ice to check it for his children and their friends to make sure that it would be okay. Archie, a monkey, finds himself on an island and he proceeds to build a home. He soon meets Clarice and Ibis and learns that the resident tiger, Beatrix, Beatrice, is friendly. When pirates capture Beatrice, Clarice and the other friends plan a rescue. It's straightforward fun in an idyllic setting. And I am sure that as a child, if I read this book, I would be convinced that I could build as nice a house as Archie did <laughs> on that island with the same equipment. As an adult, I don't think that would happen. <laughs> Sylvia is a young flamingo, and she wonders why flamingos are pink. Her mother explains about the shrimp, and so Sylvia goes around the beach trying some different things to eat and changing her color. After eating some stripes and some paisley items, she gets a stomach ache and realizes she doesn't feel like herself, so she goes back to eating shrimp. <laughs> Another ice story. I think stories about ice are good for this summer, too. We join the team near the end of their hockey game, and the rhyming text tells the action on the ice and the determination of the young players. Especially when it gets hot this summer, they're going to want, you're going to want to be reading about snow and ice and cold and penguins. <laughs> penguins and ice, yes. This tells in rhyming text about these tough, dastardly pirates who make their enemies walk the plank. We shout avast, we cry ahoy, the deadliest dangers are greatest joy. From the first mate down to the cabin boy, we are pirates, pirates, ho! Oh. And they are tough pirates until late at night when they're telling scary stories and suddenly, yikes, everybody runs for their hammock, throws their blanket over their, be uh, over their heads and waits until morning. And then they will be pirates ho again. <laughs> Very fun. Toad found a pair of glasses and now he can read. When Duck finds a pen, he is certain that he can write. So he sits on the dock by his home and he thinks and he writes. It's a story of friendship and of appreciating each other because the other animals say, oh, now that Duck's done with his story, Toad can read it. Well, we know, really, Toad can't read and Duck really can't write. But Toad comes up with something to, to save both their faces. Catfish Kate starts playing and soon several other animals are jamming with her. The boys want quiet in order to read. I love this part about the story. <laughs> the girls are being rowdy and the boys want to read. Nice. They begin to argue when Kate, and then Kate says, compromise, and they go off. Now, the boys think they've won, but here come the girls back again, and they've come up with a solution. 
And my only complaint about this book is the girls look kind of mean when they hand, they found some fluffy type stuff, you know, cotton, um, mm. from the, the, oh, I can't think of the name of the trees now, for the boys to tuck, tuck in their ears. So they look kind of mean when they hand the cotton over. But other than that, I like how they solve the problem themselves. Everybody gets to do what they want, and they found a compromise. The story of one puffin's, puffin family's experiences with their little puffling tells the readers how the birds live and how they raise their young. The puffling keeps asking if he is ready to go out into the world, but he must wait longer, just like the readers of the story have to wait to go out in the world. Gregory draws a lion in the sand at the beach. His father tells him, don't go in the water and don't leave Sandy, the lion. Gregory explores the beach by making the longest tail ever for the lion. <laughs> When he turns and he can't see his father anymore, he follows the tail back to the rest of the lion, and there's his father. It's a reassuring story of a little bit of independence with father being right there. Mm -hmm. Friends since birth on the same day, Foo the frog, Mau Mau mud puppy, and Su Lin salamander play together until Foo Foo frog gets a little bit too big for his britches, and he thinks he's the biggest thing in the world. And the other two say, well, while you were gone, we saw something bigger. And he puffs himself up and up and up until he floats away. Huh? And then he sees a little bit more of the world and he comes back and is a much better friend after that. Some nonfiction <clears throat> picture books. This is a, a brief biography of Jacques Cousteau, his inventions, oh. and his life filming the creatures of the sea to share with the world. And it does contain a one-page fold-out um, that... that turns the book the other way. So I just like to let people know that when they are really well done. Looking closely along the shore and looking closely around the pond are similar books. If people who can remember Tana Hoban will remember the similar story. In this, their first page has a picture in the very center with black all around it. And you have to guess, what is that? And then you turn ah, the page right. and you see what that is. And so it's items around the pond and around the shore, which will both be good for this summer. Then we have I am an octopus and I am a seahorse that talk about good introductory information about the lives of both of these animals, how they live, how they protect themselves, and what animals try to eat them. Beginning readers, this is uh, Station Stop 2 reader about river, North American river otters from the birth of cubs in the spring through the, the summer and winter until the next spring when the, the I don't know if they really are called cubs. Yes, they are. <laughs> Where the cubs are ready to be independent. Sorry. And it has some, just a little bit at the back of the book about the other types of otters in the world. Oh, yeah. This uh -huh. is the first beginning reader about Gilbert and the family is heading to the beach. Sister Lola is afraid of the creatures in the water and Gilbert forgot his suit. But they buy a new one for him, and he's ready to learn about surfing. A boy finds a hatching egg by a pond, and the gosling that hatches out imprints on him. Then the hatching duckling imprints on the goose. <laughs> so the boy has his hands full all summer. The, the goose and the duck follow him around. And then in the fall, they're ready to leave with their migrating um, respective animals. Hounsley and Katina, this is the fourth book about them. And this has three related stories. In the first story, Hounsley takes Katina on a canoe ride, but instead of enjoying nature, she's talking all the time, and that bothers him. In the third story, Hounsley and um, Bert teach Katina to swim, which is why she was talking so much in the first story, because she was nervous about being over the water. Oh, yeah, I think this will get checked out. <laughs> this is a My First Shared Reading, I can read title, Little Critter and his class visit the sea park, encountering horseshoe crabs, an octopus, and the shark tank. They have a great time, and it's usually one sentence per page. So. I love Skippy John Jones, as many of you know. And in this book, Skippito and Los Chimichangos paddle to an island to retrieve the frijoles El Bumblebito has stolen from them. It's more fun with, with Skippy John's imagination, and i just like to remind you that some Hispanic people love Skippy John Jones, and some Hispanic people find him offensive because of um, his uh, made-up words and things. They think that he's just too stereotypical, so keep that in mind. Oh, yeah, this will get checked out. Uh. <laughs> A National Geographic Level 2 Easy Reader 
explores some of, some of the many sharks in the ocean, and it gives an introduction to how sharks function and notes that they are now threatened. And this is a paperback copy. I found it walking through a store, so you never know. Fiction for grades 2 to 5, approximately. I notice on my list here it says grades 2 to 6, so there you go. <laughs> it's, it's a this first book has a more serious theme with it. Brothers Sandy 11 and Jack 9 are taken from their home in Pennsylvania and driven by their father to Florida, Key Largo. And they are rather afraid of him because his, their parents are separated. He's picked them up at school. They're worried about what may or may not have happened to their mother, whether she doesn't know they're gone, what happened to them. And they're afraid of their father. So they run away and they, they steal a boat and they end up hiding in Crocodile Swamp, which is a rather dangerous preserve because North American crocodiles are there. Mm -hmm. Here they learn a bit about the crocodiles firsthand, encounter a hammerhead shark, and find a friend in an old fisherman. So, kind of a tough story. Mm -hmm. Everybody loves, I think everybody who's read Humphrey stories loves Humphrey. This is book five, and it involves the students building their own small ships to be sailed across the local pond. The students and Humphrey visit the school library in preparation for the task, and Humphrey would really like to see the boat sail, but hamsters are not supposed to get wet. <laughs> this is one of the new books I just added recently. This is such, it's an action-packed adventure. It has 60 chapters in 186 pages. Brian is 12 and Rand is 10, and they have unusual lives. Along with their father, Doc Wilde, and grandfather, they often have to save the world. And one blurb about the, the book refers to them as swashbuckling explorers. <laughs> and that's it. And the Frogs of Doom are, are pretty terrible. <laughs> it's great fun and it, uh, really moves along. This is the first book in the Boys of Wartime series. Daniel is 12, and his parents own a tavern in Boston that's often frequented by British officers. They listen for information to pass along to the Sons of Liberty. And it isn't long before Daniel is expected to help carry messages and such. And he has a little trouble with this because of his fear and his lack of confidence in himself. But as the book progresses, he, he does better at the tasks that are given to him. I love the series. So I know this is a slightly older book. I think it came out in 2005. But How to Be a Pirate with Hiccup Horrendous Haddock III is great fun. The 13 Viking students must now learn to be pirates, starting with a, with a sword fighting at sea in a storm. And then they're off to seek a treasure that they've heard about. So, good story, good fun. Another manatee book. <laughs> Another manatee book. This is a sad one. Ski Water is 11, and he's enjoying his spring break when he encounters a dead manatee. And he can tell that it has been shot. He notifies the sheriff, but they find when they go back the manatee is gone. So he he figures somebody towed it away so that they wouldn't be caught. Mm -hmm. Skeet is determined to find the, the person who shot the manatee, but he's at the same time also dealing with his parents' breakup. So there's several things going on. When he discovers who shot the manatee, he learns that life is not black and white. Things can be complicated, just like with the split between his parents. Joshua, fifth grade, finds a frog with three back legs in their garden pool. He is fascinated and he does some research to find out what could have caused this. And so you get a little bit of nonfiction information in there. Oh yes, he's also a motor mouth, often getting into trouble with his parents and his teacher. There is humor and some learning about frogs, the food chain, the environment, and proper behavior during the course of the book. It's uh, very interesting and fun. I love this series. I've only seen the first two books. It's called this is called The First Tale from the Five Kingdoms. The Robe of Skulls is the title. I assume there's going to be five stories. I hope so, kingdoms. yes. <laughs> Gracie Gillipod has been living with her stepfather and stepsister, Foyce, and she is rescued from their sailor by a talkative bat named Marlin. And this is just the beginning of the first book. She makes a splash by helping others, including Prince Marcus. And in book two... Gracie, Marlin, Prince Marcus, and others are once again ready for more adventures fighting evil. Because this is a witch from another kingdom who's not supposed to be in their kingdom. Hmm. <clears throat> Forty-five short poems convey, convey the enthusiasm of the main character, Sam, 
for a vacation at the beach with his family. Lots of personality, his and his ballerina sister, is shared via the poems and illustrations in this short book. And the first part of the book is just about the driving to get to the beach, which oh, right. everybody can relate to, too. Yes. The adults. <laughs> it's very fun. Pirate School is number eight in the Pirate School series. Oh, it's called Shiver Me Shipwreck, excuse me. The series is Pirate School. In this eighth book, the Pirate School goes visiting from their home ship, the Sea Rat, over to the Bone Rat Earth. And while they're there, they go off in search of treasure and soon run into dangerous waters. So this is a good paperback series if you want to add some inexpensive books to your collection for the summer. These would be fun, and I think they would be popular with both boys and girls. Lindy Eleven, her best friend Margaret, and know-it-all Gus, Lindy's not so keen on Gus, attempt to solve the mystery of stolen jewels during the town's cucumber festival. And that's how they make a splash. And the goose is also involved in the story quite a bit. Mm -hmm. This is Sam and Friends Mystery Book 2. It's a graphic novel. Sam, an old English sheepdog, lives next door to Jenny, who can understand what he is thinking. Jenny's family goes to Sagawa Lake for a long weekend, and Jenny brings Sam and her friend Beth. While there, they learn about the evil in the lake from an old diary they found, and they think here's a mystery that they can solve. This is another title I added. I'm not sure it's on the list I showed you. Ryan's 12 and his older brother Tanner, who's 16, talks him into kayaking down the river since Tanner's friend can't go. Ryan is not outdoorsy. He prefers video games. Tanner is very outdoorsy and assures him everything will be fine. But there is trouble. Tanner is now unconscious and Ryan must decide what to do out on the river in the middle of nowhere. Newt Newman is 10, and he is used to his older brother getting all the attention, and he's fine with it. Chris is the star of the football team. Then he is injured in a bad accident and lies in the hospital. Newt is devastated. His friends talk him into going out for Halloween, and he uses some of his brother's clothes to create his Captain Nobody costume. He feels confident and strong in the costume, and no one gives him much trouble about it, even when he wears it to school after Halloween. They all know about his brother. Newt does help some people, and he gains, gets some attention for himself when he foils a jewelry store robbery. He definitely makes a splash, and his brother is getting better. This is the sequel to Claire and the Bakery Thief. It also was a graphic novel in black and white format, and tells of Claire and her friends Jet and Skye. They decide to do their group science project on water. When Jet and Skye are kidnapped, Claire and Bongo, her dog, follow the trail of fake jewels from Jet's bag. Jet's camera has the proof of why the nearby lake is polluted. Oh. Calvin is nine, and he is dismayed to learn that his cousin, Stella, who's 15, is coming to live with his family. And he has to give up his room and move into the storage room of the garage. Calvin and his friends also must face or run from bullies, along with rowing up the river and enjoying the ocean. They live in Hawaii. Nice. I should have said that sooner. <laughs> yeah. Isabel is 10, and she lives in Runny Cove, where it never stops raining. Every day, she, her friends, and all adults go to work at the Umbrella Factory, where they are paid little and treated poorly. It is a miserable existence. She runs away after her friend, and she, who she calls grandmother, has died. She then finds a new world where she is welcomed. The sun shines every day, and plants grow everywhere. But circumstances are not perfect, and she wants to help her friends back in Runny Cove. So she goes back there. I love Danny Dragon Breath. It's, these are so fun. He's the only mythical creature attending the Herpetax Phibia School for Reptiles and Amphibians. Danny and his best friend Wendell, a green iguana, stick together whether Big Eddie is bullying them. Too bad Danny can't breathe fire yet. Or whether they're visiting the ocean so Danny can research his paper for class. Black and white and green illustrations. And I love this book because there's text for a number of pages and then you'll have you're always having several illustrations, but then you'll have kind of a graphic novel format for a oh. couple of pages, and then oh. it goes back to text for a while. So it's very, um, <clears throat> it's a combination of, of formats. Danny is rather um, foolhardy, and his friend Wendell is extremely cautious, so they kind of balance each other out. 
This is the second book about Daisy Dawson. We find her she can still talk with animals and is not any better at getting to school on time. A school assignment to a report on a habitat prompts her trip to a secret pond, the cat Trixie knew about it, where two otters live. Adventure and some life science facts blended in. It's good fun, and it would be a good read aloud, too, if you're reading a, a longer story. Some nonfiction for grades two to five. Two different shipwrecks, one near the Florida Keys and one off the coast of Massachusetts, are explored in this look at how sunken ships create a habitat for sea creatures, as well as how people seek such ships and what they carry. Winter was two or three months old when she became tangled in the lines of a crab trap and her tail was badly injured. She was cut free and then taken to the Clearwater Marine Aquarium where they eventually fitted her with a prosthetic tail. I don't know if you can oh, yeah. see that there. And I've heard that's about that, the story. Oh, yeah. Did you? <laughs> yeah, I didn't hear about it until I read the book. And I assume they're going to keep her there because I don't know that she could go out mm. into the wild. But so she's alive and doing well. This tells about the collection and use of water in six countries around the world, Peru, Mauritania, the U.S., Bangladesh, Ethiopia, and Tajikistan. It gives a sense of the value and the effort needed to collect water, which sometimes those of us in this country forget. And someone at one of the summer reading program workshops pointed out, this book will be good for next year, too, when we're talking about one world and many stories. So ah, yes. Two years in a row. <laughs> From the service of the ocean to the bottom of the Marianas Trench, Jenkins gives us a look at a few of the many creatures that inhabit the ocean. A bar graph on the side of the page lets us know the depth of each scene, and it includes a two-page spread at the back of the book that gives a paragraph of information on each animal that was illustrated, along with a silhouette to show size relative to human, adult human. And I love Steve Jenkins' work. It's always so incredible. I think this will get checked out, too. <laughs> An overview of sharks and a quick look at some of the biggest great white and whale sharks and some of the smallest, cookie cutter shark and the spined pygmy shark. Excellent photos will have readers turn, turning the pages and a map of the world at the back of the book shows where each of the sharks discussed can be found. Probably other places too. Good basic life science information on alligators and crocodiles, including how they are alike and different and sure to appeal to reluctant readers. A well-written look at some of the 35 species of dolphins in the world. It has excellent photos, although over half of them are about of the bottlenose dolphin, which is the most familiar, of course. It explains the difference between dolphins and purposes and gives good basic information on their physical attributes and how they survive. Seymour Simon, I mean, I should have just said that. That's all you need to know. <laughs> Using an ongoing river timeline at the front of the book, the author tells of the formation of the Hudson River and the people who lived by it, the history the river has witnessed down through the years. The importance of the river for life, trade, and warfare is discussed. And the author mentions that the reason he was interested in the Hudson River is because that's his first name. Excellent photos and clear text provide a look at the plants, insects, and animals of salt marshes in the U.S. This is an amazing book, and it is so much more than I thought it was when I first looked at it. Weitzman shares how the Egyptians built a boat for their pharaoh Cheops to carry him into the afterlife. It's a fascinating look at the tools and techniques of the ancient people and the techniques used by the Restoration Department of Egyptian Antiquities to determine how the boat was first built. When they found it in the pyramid, it was in pieces, oh. taken apart. And so they, first they had to figure out how to put the boat together. So what it would was be supposed to look like, yeah. yeah. And then they figured out how they made the boat. But they didn't wow. stop there. Then they made their own version of that boat using only the tools that the ancient people had used wow. to build a boat. And that boat is now on display. There's a two, mm -hmm. four-page fold-out spread mm -hmm. in the book that shows, uh, well, it's a drawing, but it's a drawing of the boat as it is put together. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Anyone interested in Egypt will love this book. And these are gorgeous. The next two books are gorgeous, both poems by Jane Yolen. This one contains 14 poems by the author about egrets, and each two-page spread contains one poem, one paragraph of factual information, and one to three amazing photographs of the birds. This collection has wonderful photos that match the 12 poems of different animals, 
and uh, it's equally valuable for a poetry collection, for a collection about nature, or for photography. Fiction for younger teens. Oh gosh, this is so funny. <laughs> Matt, Sean, and Cooper are all 15, and they have agreed that this summer will not pass without each of them seeing a girl naked. <laughs> and they are determined. Their efforts to accomplish this are hilarious, with bathroom humor coming around all the time. Additionally, Matt agrees to swim the butterfly for their swim team in order to impress uh -huh. a girl, although he has never tried it before. And throughout the book, he ever once in a while thinks to himself, you know, I really should practice. <laughs> but he doesn't really get around to it very much. Uh -huh. um, again, there's bathroom humor. There's one scene where they've decided the thing to do is to dress as a girl and go in the girl's locker room. But unfortunately, an earlier encounter with a diarrhea medicine, I can't think of the name of that. Anyway, it kicks in at a bad time. And again, boys will love it. Mike is 13 and is spending the summer of 1973 with his father on a small island off Alabama. A salvage ship is looking for treasure nearby, and Mike would really like to know if they found anything. Mike and his new friend Kyle make a surprising discovery at the old fort, and the salvagers might be after them if they know what they found. It's a good adventure story, and um, in the, during the summer, a hurricane is on the way, and they have to evacuate the island. Avery Perswick is 15, and he has developed superpowers, and it's hard to keep the secret. He quit the wrestling team because he was afraid he would seriously injure someone. He has super strength and he can fly. So he only flies at night in the middle of the night so no one will see him. And while he's out and about during the night he encounters a couple of other teams who also have different superpowers. And they band together and eventually they help a couple of people. And then a lady who had promised to help them turns out to be evil and they have to go to her place and save one of their friends from her. A sequel is likely and again they're making a different, make, making a splash, making waves by helping people and developing their superpowers. This is a, the deep is the third book. I think this is going a trilogy. I think they're done now. But Ingo is the first one, the Tide Knot the second, and the deep is the third. Um, in the first book, Sapphire and her brother Connor discover that they are half mermaid, half mer people, and half human, and that they can survive in the water. And they have to decide how much time they spend on land and how much time they spend in water. In the third title, they are the only ones who can go down to the land of the Kraken. It is waking and it threatens both the Murr people and her family and friends of Cornwall. So they ha know they have to do whatever it takes to stop the Kraken and save both the land and the sea. Good timing. <laughs> George is in eighth grade and he is gifted and he knows it. He believes everyone else is beneath him. The teachers adore his intelligence and... His father is principal, which has saved him on many occasions, but now he is going along on the 8th grade science field trip for a few days, and the Bruce brothers may get their chance to beat him up. Then while they're there, they learn the hurricane is on the way, and the camp is evacuated, hmm. all except for George. He's hiding from the bullies. Katya is 13, and she should be in 8th grade, but she just cannot face school after her wonderful summer learning and exploring at wilderness camp. She talks her parents into allowing her to homeschool, but the plans her mother makes reminds her too much of middle school. It's a look at the various ways homeschooling can work, and how sometimes school is the answer, and sometimes it isn't. After the accidental death of their mother, Ben, 15, and his younger brothers, Dylan and Jerry, reluctantly join their father on a sailing trip around the Bahamas. Their father disappears one night, and the brothers must weather a terrible storm. The three end up shipwrecked on a small island. It's a survival story in more ways than one, emotional as well as physical survival. They have to figure out how to get off the island. This is book two about the mouse hunter. That's the title of the first book. And in this book, Mousebeard does have a curse he cannot walk on land. He has to stay on the ocean. So he's determined to break this curse and figure out what to do about it. And the thing about these, this world, wherever it is, is people collect mice. And different mice have different attributes. And some of them are very helpful. There are mice that help you get your sails down when you're sailing away. And there are mice that um, 
are good at battle. So it's an intriguing story, and you better like mice if you're going to read it. <laughs> Grace Pearl is 15, and she lives on Miramor, an island hidden by fog and mist. Here each summer, the princes come to learn the niceties of life. Grace Pearl is torn between her love for her childhood friend, McCree, and her need or destiny to leave the island. The only way for her to leave is to marry a prince. It's an enjoyable combination of girl power, fairy tale, and coming-of-age novel. Simon, this is book two about Simon Bloom. In this one, Simon is infused with octopus DNA, which gives him some special abilities, including being able to spew ink from his mouth. <laughs> so Simon has his work cut out for him. This is a sequel to The White Giraffe, and it's not necessary to have read that one before you read this one. Martine has a special gift, and she can communicate with animals. In this one, she and her classmates leave on a 10-day boat trip that results in shipwreck, and she communicates with the dolphins to find out why there are no ships coming by the island that they've ended up on. And there is a reason, and it's dangerous. A fictionalized account of a true event, a British warship sails into Sandy Bay in New England during the War of 1812. Lemuel, Lemuel Brooks is 12, and he is involved from the beginning in defending his home. It's just that the British are not the real problem. That turns out to be Lieutenant Hurley from nearby Gloucester. I loved Tentacles. I have not read Cryptid Hunters yet. I just bought a copy, so I'm going to. <laughs> this is a sequel to Cryptid Hunters, but you don't have to read it to enjoy this book. In this one, Marty, Grace, Luther, Wolf, and others take the coelacanth, their ship, out to try and capture a giant squid. Repercussions from previous events in the first book follow them out onto the ocean. It's a good adventure, and uh, there's definitely going to be another book. Well, I don't know that for a fact, but reading the end of this one, they left they it open got to be, enough for that. Gotta yes. be another book. <laughs> this is uh, the fictionalized story of Jules Verne's Nautilus, told by a teenager who traveled aboard it. Occasional <laughs> nonfiction interspersed with the fictional story. It comes with plenty of extra, such as small books, to open inside the pages, and it's similar in other in that way to other titles in the Ology series, which yeah. are very popular. Drizzle takes us to an extraordinary farm. They grow chocolate rhubarb, yum, Whoa. giant <laughs> rhubarb, medicinal rhubarb, regular rhubarb. Every Monday at 1 p.m. it rains, and the visitors come from all over to ride the umbrella ride during the rain. Huh. I don't know why they can't ride at other times, but that's <laughs> not covered. But now the rain has stopped. Monday at 1 o'clock it didn't rain, though. No. Polly is 11, and she's one of the children of the owners, and she's deeply concerned. What has happened to the magic? Polly needs to find her gift and hope it will rescue the farm. She can't imagine living anywhere else. Some nonfiction for teens include, these, both of these books I'm going to talk about are from the Scientists in the Field series. Jo John Craighead George, called Craig, is the son of author Jean Craighead George, and he studies bowhead, bowhead whales around the year. And this book follows him as he studies the health, size, and numbers of the whales caught by the native Inupiaq Eskimos during their twice annual harvest. Excellent photos, and some of the photos shows the whales being cut apart, so sensitive kids might find that unappealing, but it's a fact of life. And there's a frog scientist, John Ty uh, Tyron Hayes, and his assistants are um, in the field and in the lab where they gather and study a variety of frogs. Fiction for older teens? Yeah, we're going to get done on time probably. Ruby is 17, and she lives in New Orleans with her grandma, Mama Luce. She lived in the bayou until her parents died, and she still talks the dialect when Mama Luce lets her. She communes with plants and animals, and she knows a big spin is on the way. Hurricane Katrina is coming, and Ruby warns those she can. Then Katrina hits, and Ruby tries to save Mama Luce and others in their area of New Orleans. It's unusual, but it gives a sense of the disaster and what people went through. And what I like about this book is that Ruby and some other people have found a spot in New Orleans where it's above the water level, mm -hmm. and they're bringing people they find trapped to this spot where they are helped, given food, and so it's people helping each other, and yeah. I like that version. I know other things happen, but yeah, this is one thing. These things happen, too. That's right. Yeah. This is a sequel to the book Exodus. After being refused entrance to the city on stilts, Mara, who's about 16, and the refugees are that are following her ride a huge white ship to look for land in the north where they hope they can survive. 
The ship is on automatic pilot and the passengers have no idea how long it will take to reach their destination if there really is land somewhere. I should have said this is after the ice, polar ice caps have melted and the world is covered. As far as everybody knows, there is no more land and that's mm -hmm. why the city on stilts, there are more than one of them. But they are the one they found was an enclosed um, city and wouldn't allow more people to come in. It's, an, um, we, it's a survival tale and a, a third book is in the works in this series. This is another new addition to the list. Incarceron is a vast prison, one that no one can enter and no one can leave. Finn, deep inside the prison, is desperate to leave and he finds a crystal key. Claudia, daughter of the warden, also finds a crystal key. Finn and Claudia can then communicate using these keys. Finn and a couple of companions are seeking a way out and Claudia is looking for a way to avoid an arranged marriage. Um, they really do make waves in this world and a sequel is likely. I think a sequel is imperative, but <laughs> some people don't always agree with me. Fourteen stories are intertwined after they all spend a week at the same resort in the Bahamas. And so uh, the book is divided into four sections. Each section is from one teen's point of view. And I really like some of the things about this is the first girl who's talking. She is very, um, her self-image is very poor. But when you read what the other people have to say, they really think she's pretty cool. So um, I think that's an important message to get out to mm -hmm. kids. This is book seven in the Bloody Jack series. I've read books one, two, and now seven. Mm -hmm. And I had no problem missing out on three to six as far as knowing what's going on in seven. On the day of their wedding, prior to their wedding, Jackie and her intended Jamie are taken by the British and forced to serve their homeland again. Jackie is to dive off the Keys of Florida for a treasure lost by the Spanish. Lots of action and adventure and also lots of Jackie flirting with fellas she encountered in previous adventures and parading around in her swimsuit she designed for herself. But she is still chaste. She is Jamie's girl. It's sure to be popular with fans of the series. Going for an evening sail alone, Lolly, 15, was caught by surprise when her boat capsized after a big wave. Hitting her head left her unconscious and then confused. When she comes to herself, she realizes she's riding on one of three manatees and they take her to a small uninhabited island. She has to figure out how to survive on that island and how to get off of it because there's nobody else there. Miles is 16 and he has moved down to New Orleans to live with his father since his mother remarried. Hurricane Katrina hits and Miles, his father and his uncle try to leave town but their car breaks down so they end up in the Superdome with many others. Mm -hmm. Trying to build a family is hit head on by disaster. It's a realistic look at the conditions people suffered in the Superdome, at least as far as I've heard, and it's complete with coarse language where appropriate. So this is the other side of that story that we read about in movies, imagine. And I think it's an important book, too. So thank you. That's all my titles. That's all my great. Um, Does anybody have back? any questions or comments or anything for Sally? Anything you want to ask about or anything um, you want to say? I saw your message there, Laura, about you and Carol showing up, so I got, I've got you down. And remember, if you want a, a printout of the list of books, to go to yes. the Library Commission website and search for the, the word handouts, and that will mm -hmm. take you to the page I showed you. And then you can click on the summer reading program theme, and then you get most of the books I talked about and the little blurbs I have about them. So great. And the check marks on there, those mean that the books were added since um, the NLA NEMA conference last fall. It ah, says okay. that at the end of the page, but it's kind of so updated list. Right. Okay. I said, thank you. Laura says, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Laura. I'm glad you all came and, and uh, heard me talk again about books for summer. And mm -hmm. I'll probably get to do another one of these Absolutely. about other books. Yeah, we need, yeah. So I hope um, we'll yeah. visit again. Yeah.
Yeah, thank you very much, Sally. It was very, lots of um, really cool reads. Every time you do this, I always think I need to go and read some of these books just because <laughs> they sound so interesting. Some of them. There's lots of good ones. I get good ideas to buy books for all my friends' kids. Yes, <laughs> Actually, yes. I steal them ideas from here. Good. <laughs> um, so thank you, everyone. I guess we'll wrap up then if there's no questions or anything. Thank you very much for attending. Um, as I said, this is recorded, so we'll have a recording up soon, um, today or tomorrow. This book list you can get online on the website, um, so go ahead and grab that. And I hope you'll join us next week when we have the first in a three-part series here on Encompass Live about conducting surveys. Uh, Catherine Brockmeyer, one of our staff here at the Commission, is going doing a um, session one each month in the next three months about how to do surveys and collect information um, about what your users are doing and how, how you can use that um, to, at your library. To Sounds get more good. So hopefully you join us for that next time. Thank you very much. And um, I'll just say bye-bye. <laughs>